this separation of land, labor, and capital, the devaluation of the labor within it, it's an age old system that has its roots hundreds of years in the past. Ultimately, this nationalistic logic is fundamentally about one thing. That is that wealth moves to the center, wealth moves into the nation, waste moves out or it stays out. And that is the fundamental underlying nature of industrial policy today and the problems that are underlying sustainability to this day. Hello and welcome to Planet Critical, the podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm a climate corruption journalist and your host. Every week I interview experts who are battling to save our planet. My guests are scientists, politicians, academics, journalists and activists. They explain the complexities of the energy, economic, political and cultural crises we face today, revealing what's really going on and what they think needs to be done. These are the stories of the big picture. Go to planetcritical.com to learn more and subscribe. My guest this week is Laurie Parsons. Laurie is a senior lecturer in human geography at Royal Holloway, the University of London, and the principal investigator of the projects The Disaster Trade, The Hidden Footprint of UK Imports and Investment Overseas, and also Hot Trends, How the Global Garment Industry Shapes Climate Vulnerability in Cambodia. This year, Laurie published the excellent book Carbon Colonialism, How Rich Countries Export Climate Breakdown, explaining the depths of greenwashing that allow corporations and nations off the hook for their impact on the environment, and how fudging accountability is baked into the very system that they claim will solve the climate crisis. Laurie joins me to discuss his research, explaining the tension between a global political economy, national legal jurisdictions, and a populace that is drowning in information but with no tools about how to verify such information. He explains how the only people footing the climate bill right now are local and indigenous people around the world who are suffering under the extractive actions of corporations and the reticence of national governments to act. We talk about legislative justice, the good examples of legislation that are being demonstrated around the world, with the EU in particular leading the charge on forcing companies to be accountable for every step of their supply chain. We talk about the history of greenwashing, how it emerged in the 1960s, the tension between individual consumer choice and structural change, the tension between making a difference where you can and having a vision for the future. We discuss violence and non-violence as political strategies, with Laurie explaining how the separation of land, labor and capital has long been a strategy for moving wealth into the world's most powerful nations and moving waste out. I hope you all enjoy the episode. If you do, please share it far and wide. And if you're loving the show, become a patron on Patreon or support Planet Critical with a paid subscription at planetcritical.com. By signing up, you'll get the Planet Critical newsletter inspired by each episode delivered straight to your inbox every week. You'll also have access to the wonderful Planet Critical community who are full of inspiring thoughts, ideas, critiques and determination. The links are in the description box below. I'm so grateful to everyone who chooses to support the project. I'm a vehement believer in ad-free and open access content, so Planet Critical wouldn't exist without the direct support of the amazing community. Thank you so much to all of you who believe in Planet Critical and keep the project going every week. Laurie, thank you very much for joining me on Planet Critical. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. My first question for you is, why is the world in crisis and what can we do about it? Well, that is a big question. So from my point of view, I think that the biggest challenge that we're facing is a question of information. So we are living now in an age in which our world is more interconnected and more interdependent than it's ever been before. And yet our capacity to A, monitor it in a direct sense and B, or more importantly, even than that, to actually regulate it, to meaningfully legislate what happens within this vast factory of production and movement of materials all around the world is vastly reduced. So in the last 50 years or so, our global economy has exploded to this kind of web of interconnection. And yet our kind of political economy, our, our legislation, our parliaments, they remain within that same national jurisdiction. So companies have completely got the upper hand over any capacity of people to regulate them. And essentially we're constantly playing catch up, trying to actually control what companies do when increasingly we, we just don't actually have that power anymore. So reining in the power of companies, especially in an environmental sense, is a key challenge that I think is really, really important and one that we have to face up to, even though 
by no means a small one. Mm. And I mean, what do we do? We're kind of going straight into the deep end here. But what do we do as well, given the amount that has been revealed in recent years, especially with COVID and things about PPE contracts and all this kind of thing? Like, it does seem increasingly obvious that uh, governments, yes, they are limited by their national jurisdiction, but that national jurisdiction also exists to unleash the potentiality of corporations for companies to prioritize profit and to make a profit off of the the labor of national citizens. So. Given that relationship exists, what do we do then? Well, this has always been the case that, you know, the world has always been international. I'm definitely not attempting to harp back to some kind of, I don't know, some strange like national utopia or dystopia when everything was contained within a single state. That's never been the case. We've always had, you know, the Silk Road, for example, like the Roman Empire that had uh, production systems and like going all around the world and, you know, producing things throughout its jurisdiction. That's always been the case, more or less. But what does change is the actual capacity of the buck to stop somewhere. So what we've got is a situation whereby the world is so interconnected and companies have outgrown any single national jurisdiction to such an extent that even if they're doing something that's completely anathema to the law of one given country, that responsibility gets passed around the entire circuit from place to place to place. And ultimately, it's almost impossible to pin responsibility on any individual, even on any kind of organization as such. What tends to happen in very big corporate situations is if you find some example of major corporate abuse, major kind of environmental abuse linked to the production of a major company's good, they just say, oh, that, was our, that wasn't us, that was our partner. You know, we're very disappointed with our partner. We've cut ties with them. Partner goes on to a different major company. And nobody actually has to foot the bill for all of this, all of this kind of destruction, apart from the local people and the local communities, the people in the places they're affected. And this is something that's always brought home to me, you know, working in a place like Cambodia, for example, the last three, four years, I've been working a lot on the kind of global production of the garment industry. And, um, we found all kinds of major issues that really, really big global brands are, are kind of indirectly causing. So for example, we found that in Cambodia, like something like 30% of all the factories were burning, uh, forest wood in order to power boilers, to make steam, to iron clothes. And because this was, uh, because this happens in major kind of hub factories that do all of the ironing for all of the large part of the industry, very big names are associated with this. And we bring it out, we put it in the public sphere. It gets into the media. The companies, if they respond at all, just say like, disappointed in the partner that's that draw a line under it no one is actually responsible and that is the key problem we're facing it's about bringing back that responsibility so in a boring and practical sense what this means is we just need to get a handle on this somehow and one way of doing that is to put a handle on legislating imports in the sense that we say what we use within our national borders has to conform to certain standards if it's found not to then you the lead company are responsible that's a big change in mindset, but it's something that is just beginning to be considered something that could happen. We're just getting the first green shoots of legislation there. The EU has been pretty good on this. I mean, they created a law last year around the kind of uh, timber that is used in products, saying that if any of your timber comes from forests that aren't certified or especially illegal, you, you cannot bring it into the European Union. And that was on the end supplier, essentially. So it sent ripples up the entire supply chain, forcing this kind of more interconnectedness between uh, companies and where they source their materials from. Um, of course, some of the pushback from that was like, oh, well, it's all very well if Europe does it, but if China's not... <laughs> I can't even... <laughs> I can't even finish it without laughing. The whataboutism. Um, what other examples of that kind of legislative um, uh, legislation are we seeing now? Well, there's been a few. I mean, the EU is a good example. So, I mean, the biggest one at the moment is the, the German supply chain law, which are probably, hopefully going to be kind of rolled out more widely in, in the EU. The UK had a very kind of weak law. Uh, uh, back Sorry, in... can you explain the German supply chain law? Right. So the, the German supply chain law essentially says a lot, a lot, does a lot of the things that we've been talking about in a quite limited way, as in it, for a start, places some restrictions on the ways in which goods imported to Germany can be produced. And secondly, there's a thing that has actually led 
many people who are maybe more radical on this kind of topic to be very critical of it because it got very watered down, but it provides some facility for people affected by the activities of any company trading in Germany to challenge them in the German court of law. What? So as in, if your livelihood is affected overseas, then you can challenge a company that trades in Germany and say, this company ruined my livelihood or it affected or it, you know, used up my forest, for example. Right. And it's this kind of legislative justice in global right. production systems, which is really, really missing. And it's largely missing from that law. And that's one of the biggest criticisms of it. There's something left, but hardly anything. Um, so that kind of justice is, is really important because ultimately national courts have very little power in these systems. And that's a massive problem. If you're kind of at the bottom of this, you know, gradient of global economy, then you as a producer country, be it Bangladesh, be it Cambodia, you know, you can't actually do that much to take the companies to task because they're so important to your economy. I mean, for example, um, H and M major global brand, about 5% of the GDP of Bangladesh, massive, wow. but the, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to annoy these companies and actually H and M does quite a lot of good stuff uh, of its own, but they're one of the better ones. But the point is you have to have that kind of, that backstop that is really important. Hmm. I like that. The idea of, um, legislative justice, um, although it seems almost, um, oxymoronic because the justice should be built into the legislation from the off and it just goes I know, to but we're, you're right i mean but we're so we've become so inured to the idea that like the law is like old-fashioned it's like you know that was for the 20th century now companies decide justice we've got csr you know we've got mm -hmm. uh we've got brand image and that's how you know good things are supposed to happen but of course you know that only goes so far it only goes so far as when it's profitable you know it's sounding very corporate anti-corporate rather i should say but I mean, there's just so many examples of this. I mean, like, for example, when COVID hit, right, that was a crisis that hit companies, it hit people, it hit governments, it hit everything. And, um, in Cambodia at the time, Cambodia is very dependent on the garment industry as a major exporter. A lot of companies who had ordered, uh, goods to be made and the goods were made when those, uh, when the COVID hit and those kind of orders suddenly weren't required, they simply didn't purchase the products that they paid for like a one-sided contract situation. So this is the thing, if you don't have actual legal frameworks to back up these international systems, it's always like, I'll do good things as long as, you know, as long as, uh, it suits my interests or it's kind of fits the bottom line. I interviewed Matt Kennard recently and he was talking about the, um, ICIDS system which is essentially this like v little known uh, fifth arm of the World Bank. And it's like an international court uh, where companies can take states to court, to this court, uh, whereby, by the way, nobody actually has to have any legal qualifications, people presiding over the cases. Um, and they can sue nations for a loss of profits, essentially. So that can be if, a, you know, if a new government gets in, if a left wing government comes in and says, hey, do you know what, please don't, you know, cutting down our forests anymore. Timber companies can come in and say, well, you've just denied us a whole bunch of profits. So we're going to sue you for billions. Um, and there is a case currently going on in Honduras. Um, and Honduras is being sued for 30 percent of its GDP. Well, there you go. And you know, mm -hmm. probably, probably there's not an expectation of winning it, but it's like you tie these things up in like legal costs and like extremely expensive battles. And then ultimately, you know, you've given companies a huge amount to think or countries rather and governments a huge amount to think about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, I didn't know that, but yeah, I'll have to look into it further. It's a, it's a shocking example. He's got a great book, How Corporations Overthrew Democracy, but it's just, it's, it's these kinds of, I think this is so, so interesting around trying to, trying to get a vague understanding of like the big picture and seeing like all of this like good work being done, you know, around like, you know, this is how we need to reform our laws or these are the new laws that need to come in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then we just have this like shadowy other system, the shadowy economic system of, of corruption and crony capitalism, the shadowy legislative um, system that only exists to support corporations um, shadowy everything and it's like how can the good come to light and how can the good function and make advancements when the roots of the darkness go so deep into the shadows that a most of the public are not aware of it 
um, and be so much power and money and influence is concentrated in those arenas that it's almost impossible to take them down. No, I mean, that's, that's absolutely right. And I mean, this is one of my major kind of my major problems with the idea of sustainable consumption that, you know, I talk about in my writing quite a lot is that, you know, sustainable consumption is seen as the main route that people have to the main outlet for their, their kind of worries and concerns about sustainability and climate change. It's just like, oh my God, this is really stressing me out. I better go and buy something green. But the problem is, the problem is, although I really, really appreciate perhaps more than many other people do that the majority of people genuinely have the will to do something about these sustainability issues and about climate change. Problem is ordinary people just do not have the oversight on these products that they would need to make meaningfully green decisions. It's just too easy in our complex global economy to make something look green that is indistinguishable from something that is actually produced in a sustainable way. But greenwashing products is now so ubiquitous that it's almost impossible to distinguish them from something that is actually meaningfully sustainable. It's a whole lot more expensive to do something meaningfully sustainable. So the market's flooded with things that in many cases are literally just colored green. You know, that's not even a new idea, you know, you know, even like Mentos gum, I think like started doing all these kind of, um, adverts where they put sort of put like rubber plants and sort of green foliage behind it as part of a kind of sustainable campaign. It's all you have to do. You just allude to it and then, you know, you'll get the green dollar, but people don't have that capacity to to look beyond that and that's no fault of the public it's just it's just that we don't put the systems in place for them to do it absolutely it's very hard to prioritize sustainability when it's the for profit maxim that drives the free market um but let's go into some of these examples that you've got on greenwashing from you know your book as well carbon colonialism because greenwashing is one of my favorite topics as well i just love it <laughs> um, what are some of these methods by which companies greenwash apart from just you know pretending that one material is better than another. What about this kind of moving the, the buck around, moving responsibility around um, in order to offset their own sustainable accountability? Yeah, so, I mean, one of the things that I always find fascinating about greenwashing when I'm reading about it or teaching it is just how far it goes back. I mean, we're looking all the way back to the 60s. As soon as people kind of had a public sense of sustainability and the problems being created by the modern world, um, almost immediately companies are kind of wise to this. So like Earth Day One in 1970, there was already a ton of products that came out in order to sort of link into that. And a famous one, I think I do mention, uh, in the book is this, you know, uh, for example, um, you know, the Coca-Cola bottle that kind of Coca-Cola brought out this, uh, this poster, which just had the normal Coca-Cola bottle. It said the bottle for the age of ecology, because of course you can use it again. I mean, it's kind of true. This is an early example of greenwashing, relatively harmless, I guess, because like they're doing the same thing, but sort of just cashing in on that, on that green dollar. But by Earth Day 20 in 1990, about 25% of all of the products that came out in the US all had green claims of one, of one sort or another. The interesting thing is what happened in, in between, like in the interim there is that companies got a bit too bold. For example, you had this kind of, um, like the, this famous, uh, example of the, of Chevron, the, the oil company that had this, uh, this petroleum, like Chevron F370. And they had all this really bold marketing campaign about how green this petrol was. It was just, uh, it was like, for example, showing exhaust pipes with a balloon being filled with clear, uh, just clear, pure air, you know, clouds everywhere, just showing how incredibly, uh, incredibly green this petrol was. And then, you know, your normal petrol would just like black acrid clouds. Um, so Chevron went on with this for five years, just constantly saying that this was, you know, like the greenest petrol ever, that it was, you know, the cleanest petrol ever, you know, that the more you drive, the more you save the planet, all these kind of claims yeah. until eventually around 1975, the U S federal court were like, this is just so untrue. We cannot let this go on. It's like, it's not only untrue, it's, this is actually worse if anything than a normal petrol. So like Chevron, you know, the punishment was they had to discontinue it, but ultimately they made a whole lot of money in the, in the interim. Tell me, tell me, was, was there, was there anything different about their petrol or was it just purely a marketing campaign? F370. I believe there was one additional active ingredient, but it was used in a lot of other petrols as well. 
So it wasn't anything particularly innovative in itself. So, I mean, it was, the claim was based on a small thing, which is inaccurate. And the petrol as a whole was absolutely no greener than the average sure. petrol. Sure. Worse, if anything. But as a result of that kind of case, um, companies have got wise to making claims that are too specific. So there's this whole industry of kind of the illusion and the sort of, you know, the, <laughs> the suggestion of greenness. And as I say, often this just literally involves like, um, do you remember Coca-Cola Life? Was Coca-Cola sort of, you know, Life? Life, yeah, yeah. It was, it was a very unsuccessful project, product. It got pushed for a very short time. Um, it was essentially they used stevia rather than sugar. I don't really understand why this is supposed to make it greener. One's like a leaf, another one's sugar. But I think the whole marketing campaign was just like, it was, you know, it was always in grass. It had these kind of blooming floral backgrounds. It was just, you know, all natural materials around it. But by that point, I think this was like the 2010s and people were wise to it. So right. it didn't quite work anymore. Right. But so much money has been made in that way, just kind of alluding while you do one green thing and then actually everything else in the supply chain is worse. Mm. Um, yeah. And I mean, it's been going on for, it's been going on for decades. It actually used to, it used to have a different word. It used to be called in the sixties. It was eco pornography. It only got changed to greenwashing in the eighties. That's fascinating. I wish eco pornography is actually more effective. (laughs) We'll go back to that. Maybe that's, maybe that's the next step. But, um, but the, um, but yeah, the, the green, the word greenwashing, it comes from, as you, as you may well know, it comes from, um, those signs that we still see in hotels to this day, it says, you know, like, you know, save the planet. If you don't want your hotel towel to be washed, uh, leave it on the hook. If you want it washed, put it on the floor. And that's been going on since the eighties. And it was an example of how, um, a business can appear to be really concerned about the environment. It can get that green dollar, get people who care about the environment in without having to spend anything. In fact, they're saving. Um, and there's no kind of investment in the wider environment. Shocking. So, yeah. Utterly a lot of shocking. continuity. This is the thing. A lot of continuity from one day, one year to the next and one decade to the next. We always think it's the nature of this kind of extremely technologically novel world. We think we're in uncharted territory, but the lines and the history has gone a long way back. I actually didn't know that greenwashing went all the way back to the 60s. Thank you very much for that. And especially that eco-pornography. I mean, that's that I'm going to be trying that out very regularly from now on. I think the, one of the most effective sort of greenwashing campaigns has been this like quite um, subtle but consistently reinforced message that it is up to individual consumers to change their behavior and then that will save the planet. And it completely diverts attention. I mean, obviously, one of the most amazing examples of greenwashing is uh, the fact that it was BP that hired a marketing team to come up with the concept of carbon footprint. Like, how do we offset the impact of our industry onto our individual consumers? That is just astonishing. And that doesn't seem to be something that's been particularly tackled yet at all. I mean, there should, surely there should be legislation around that. Oh, yeah. I mean, absolutely. And. Um- it's just amazing the extent to which this mindset is just so mainstreamed into the way that people think about sustainability. Yeah, it's, a, it's all about personal responsibility. And this is actually quite a contentious topic. I mean, the nature of environmentalism is that it tends from the outside. I mean, I think if you don't care about the environment at all, you're like, oh, there's environmentalists, they're all this big gang. You know, they're all like, you know, the sandal wearing hippies. Actually, there's a huge amount of contestation and disagreement in the environmental realm about what actually is correct behavior. Um, so loads of people do see it as, you know, their, their most effective tool to kind of do things themselves and the public in general see that as their most effective tool. Generally in the kind of more institutionalized side, there's increasingly a lot of skepticism about how much this can do, but then it's, where are you on the spectrum? Like how much do you modify your own behavior? How much is it all a structural problem? But yeah, ultimately, I mean, the thing is you can, as an individual, do something to reduce your own consumption. You can probably only do that if you're in a relatively privileged position in society. If you have the money to pay extra for goods, if you have the money to, you know, and the time to, to take things more slowly, if you can afford, for example, to holiday in the UK, rather than just taking a cheap package holiday abroad, often the cheapest thing. Um, all of these things essentially are structured by your position in society, but more fundamentally, we just don't have control as individuals over that much of our wider 
carbon footprint. This is the thing. So, you know, the, the, the carbon footprint of a Brit is something over six tons a year. How much can you actually reduce that? You can get down the flying. You can definitely do that. And you can try to reduce, you can try and buy local vegetables and things, but there's so many aspects that you just have no control over your built environment. You know, for example, your, um, like the energy that you're using, you don't have an infinite choice of energy suppliers often you've only got one or two and they may not necessarily be green enough if you're living in certain areas you may have these choices but many people don't honestly we're just sitting on top of a structure of economic activity that we have no control over we can only tinker at the edges and it's great i really have huge respect for people who spend a lot of time on that that individual aspect but ultimately it's not enough because we're only talking about a certain very privileged section of society who can do a little bit. Structural change is the only way to really make these things count and make a real difference in the long run. Absolutely. And of course, environmentalists have come under fire for being sort of blind to that reality that not everybody can afford to be an environmentalist and lacking that structural critique of how um, that which we don't choose on our you, the families were born into our built environment, the nation, the passport, all of this kind of stuff and how we are treated by our society. The fact that there is still so much precarity for most people in terms of surviving on a day-to-day -day basis versus being worried about the planet. It's very understandable how environmentalism for so long was a kind of middle-class issue because for those who are privileged enough to have that be the thing that they are concerned about and have the resources with which to change their behaviors, well, no wonder they sort of, you know, got a hard time from everybody else and rightly so. Um, but as long as we allow for this kind of, I want to say continued paradigm of greenwashing, the fact that there is this belief that there is a green dollar and in using that green dollar as opposed to an oil dollar, <laughs> you are making some difference in the world. Are we not delaying the necessary structural changes that will have to be made? Yeah. So again, and this, you know, this comes back to the sort of the spectrum issue. So this is where the contestation is, right? You know, some people say, isn't it just, it's got to be better, right? To, to make these individual choices and at least do that little bit. But other people almost want to see that pressure build because there's a faith in the fact there is this social impetus that if you just don't give people that outlet to take away the stress of what they're seeing all around the world every day then maybe the political pressure will build enough in order to actually you know, make some kind of meaningful change. You have to kind of make the only real outlet, that, that kind of that political one, that kind of real structural one. And certainly I think this is what, you know, major environmentalist groups like Just a Foil, for example, or XR will largely be working towards. I know certainly XR have always, they subscribe to this, um, I think it's a 3.4% rule. Um, I don't know if you know their kind of history, but they're actually kind of, uh, founded by academics in 2018, a hundred academics all kind of sound, uh, signed this charter and they, um, they had the idea that if they just studied the history of nonviolent revolutions sufficiently, they could work out the science of how to actually overturn this status quo and kind of work towards something. And so the theory of it is all really sound. And what we're seeing now is the kind of, yeah, the real difficulty of actually enacting that. But this idea of the 3.4% was essentially that if you can just get this small number of people in society on average through history to be really meaningfully and actively on board with your agenda, to actually, you know, they're willing to march, they're willing to actively kind of participate. If you can get that, then that will be enough to kind of overturn even the biggest social norms. You know, obviously there's all kinds of historical precedents like civil rights, for example, like the anti-colonial movements throughout history. I this mean, a, they may still be right, but would they're nowhere near three percent is the problem. <laughs> this is this is Roger Hallam's thesis, wasn't it? Um, his big piece of work, uh, the three point four percent thing. I mean, what do you think about? Have you read How to Blow Up a Pipeline by Andreas Malm? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. My listeners are going to be shaking their heads because I just I bring this up all the time on the show. Um, but I mean, what do you think about that as a theory then? That actually there is no such thing as a truly nonviolent movement. The nonviolent movement advances because after not being listened to for so long, there is a radical flank who pops up. And as long as they are disavowed by the moderate flank, by the nonviolent flank, they make the moderate flank look, well, they make the nonviolent flank look 
moderate enough to be invited to the table um, out of fear of what the radical flank might achieve. And obviously that is essentially the tension between violence and nonviolence. You don't get your Martin Luther King without your Malcolm X. What do you think about that? Well, I mean, unfortunately, I mean, I think there's probably some truth to this. I mean, I like not to think mm. that it's true. I mean, I don't want to advocate on, or make anyone believe that the only path forward is, is violence because that's just depressing in a wider sense. Um, I think if you look historically, you can certainly make a good case for that. Um, I mean, even, you know, the most famous nonviolent movement of all, kind of like Gandhi's nonviolent movement, the movement was pressured into, into violence at points. And it was actually these flashpoints with the kind of, with the British forces, um, throughout that kind of previous history that not necessarily through the fault of the movement itself, but those kind of flashpoints of violence did ultimately galvanize it. And, uh, yeah, the kind of losses and the kind of human element of that was a really powerful force for the spread. But I mean, I think maybe that's a good example of, you don't have to be that active. You don't have to seek the violence, you know, sometimes it just comes and that's enough to galvanize it. But I don't necessarily think this is the only path we can go through. There's still potentially other ways. I mean, we're stimmied in the UK, uh, with our kind of electoral system that it doesn't allow as much access to green politics as it really should. A huge number of people vote for green, the green party, uh, and other green link parties. Um, and yet the electoral representation of that is extremely small. If you look at how a kind of more proportional system in Germany, uh, manifests, then the greens have real power there. And that's, uh, that's manifested in things like that, you know, groundbreaking, even if not perfect supply chain law. So I do believe in, in the ballot box. The problem is we have we have a lot of constraints in this country and it's not easy. <laughs> yeah, the ballot box is stuffed and before you even get to the polls. That was the problem. <laughs> yeah, that is the problem. So, I mean, one of the things I've been recommended to people, because people always do want to know what they can do. So, I mean, a practical and actual actually thing you can get involved in on a day-to-day -day basis is to get involved in your local council. And this is a level of politics where you can actually make structural change, mm. at not the biggest level, but at a level bigger than the individual. And, you know, as an individual, you can find other people in your kind of, in your, in your neighborhood and actually contribute to meaningful change. And that can build from there. So I do think we're very privileged despite the constraints of our, you know, our kind of national level governments. We're very privileged in this country or in the UK, I should say, in order to actually have that democratic structure, which gives us some route to making decisions, even if it's not at the biggest level and we can use it for green ends, because that's a place that people who care about their community can actually make kind of durable impacts that go beyond the individual and actually will leave a legacy. I think there's a nice overlap here of spectrum again. So we talked about the difference between like, you know, individual choice versus structural change. And then also there's this interesting tension between like big picture thinking, you know, the vision for how we want the world to look versus people taking responsibility for making their environments better, making their communities healthier and happier and more autonomous and more self-sufficient and more resilient for whatever changes are coming. We have a pretty good idea of what changes are coming. Um, and I find that to be a really interesting spectrum to try and dance along as well, because you do see often in certain activist circles, there's often the guy who really, you know, has the vision for what the world should look like and is very focused on achieving that vision. Whereas there's something about the complexity of the world that we live in today, the systems of the world that we live in today, that quite frankly, until we unleash an AGI on all of the information that we have where we started this conversation, no one brain is going to be able to figure out what the world should look like. No one brain can handle one big, big, big picture. And a diversity of community organization, a diversity of response, a diversity of culture is the thing that has always made humankind resilient to whatever changes it has gone through. So I actually really like this, these kinds of ideas of encouraging people to go into like council level politics because you really can have an impact there and you can sort of have that sort of change that then inspires and creates ripples throughout the system. This idea of kind of one day waking up and having all the power and then mandating whatever, whatever a green world could look like, that kind of sends chills down my spine as well, because there's a huge amount of room for making mistakes there. 
No, absolutely. I mean, it's a 20th century way of looking at the world. And, you know, we've seen all the harm that that can do, as well as some good, of course. But yeah, the idea that, you know, you can have one scheme that will determine everything that's happening. It's just, if it was ever true, and I'm not sure it was ever true, if it was ever true, it's certainly not now. Um, but yeah, what you need is power. This is the thing. You need to actually give people power to kind of actually scrutinize. You've got to give people the tools to see. And we can demand that. It's demanding that that is the key bit. But once people can actually see what is happening, then they can exercise their power as individuals and they can build a better movement. Because honestly, if people could see, you know, what actually happens behind these kind of smiling adverts with their kind of, uh, you know, their, their, their like blooming fields and kind of natural fabrics. In reality, it's a, it's a very, I mean, it's devastating to see it. And this is, uh, is something that, would galvanize a huge amount if it could be more broadly known. Can we talk through another few examples then from your book? I'm aware that I took us I'm skipping off into abstract conversation. Land. <laughs> but let's go back to some of these terrible ways that greenwashing exists within our current system. And what are the top examples that you would want people to know about? Well, I think for the UK listeners, one of the things they might be most interested about then is, um, again, going back to this built environment. Like you think about the brick, for example. Bricks are a very boring commodity. I think this is just, I mean, it's literally a lump of earth. Nobody in their right mind would think this lump of earth has come 18,000 kilometers to get to me. Wow. In reality, tens of millions of bricks are imported to the UK every year from South Asia. And this is something that is completely beyond environmental regulation. Um, you think about how heavy a brick is and how low value it is. The weight of these things in tons being moved in container ship after container ship. So one container of bricks, for example, which I think I'm right in remembering is about 80,000 bricks, um, that will emit 600 tons of carbon in the journey, just forget the production, just in the journey from South Asia, for example, India or Pakistan, where the majority of them come from, to uh, the south of the UK, where it will come in. Hang so, on. One container, like one, one shipping container. container. Yeah. And hundreds of thousands of these things come in every, every year. And again, that's not going on any ad. No company selling these things is paying any kind of tax or having to declare that they've emitted hundreds of thousands of tons in getting this stock. Just to put that into, into we, context. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Into context, that 600 tons is the same, of, same weight as five blue whales. And it's gas. Five blue whales weight of gas. For one container, that I mean, this is something that's actually come like, uh, it's, it's a relatively recent phenomenon. So up till about 2008, the, the global recession, the UK was pretty self-sufficient in terms of bricks, but a few, uh, big kilns shut down as a result of the lack of demand at that time. Since then we import more and more. And because there's so little scrutiny over the, um, the environmental impacts of what we import. This is kind of a canary in the coal mine kind of worst example that just shows you how little scrutiny there is. Because there's so little scrutiny, as of 2022, the last data that, are, that, well, that exists, we imported 570 million bricks in 2022. Now, not all of them came as, from as far away as India and Pakistan. Some of them do. Some of them come from Australia, specialist ones, for example. But they're coming from, you know, in tens of millions from places like Turkey, for example. It's again, a very long journey. And again, as I say, tens of millions of these things all of the time. It's just, it really demonstrates, I think, as well as anything can, just how little control and how little oversight we have over these kind of processes. Because mm -hmm. nobody would buy this. Like mm -hmm. if it just had a label, if it had to have a label on it saying, you know, six blue whales or five blue whales of gas were emitted in the container that brought this, nobody would buy that. It triples the carbon cost of a home. You build a house with these bricks, triples it. And so no one would buy that house. That's... But of course, there's no, no obligation whatsoever to, to report it. And that's the key problem. That is astonishing. It triples the carbon cost of a home. I mean, of course, right, it makes sense, but still. Ah, it's so complicated. It is so complicated. 
Because, I mean, when you think about the renewable transition as well and the amount of parts and components and actual, you know, fully functioning panels that are going to come out of and are coming out of places like China predominantly, um, AR dependence um, on one nation to for the vast majority of manufacturing. It was fine when they were just manufacturing our clothes, eh? We were okay with that now that they're manufacturing the bits that are of the future. You know, that's a little bit more worrisome um, for geopolitics. But how do we then, what do we do about sustainability when we are so interconnected globally that we do kind of depend on each other for all of these different moving parts? And you can't just bring industry home overnight, even if you're Biden and you input the Inflation Reduction Act. It just doesn't work like that. It's a real issue. So, um, I mean, again, a good example of this that I like to use is the, is the garment industry. Um, so, you know, major producers of garments that you will see on the label of your clothes that you'll pick up in a normal high street store. It might be Cambodia makes about 4% of UK garments. Bangladesh, I think, makes about 10%. But Bangladesh and Cambodia don't have any cotton fields. They don't produce any of the material that actually goes into uh, making those clothes. Majority of cases, they also don't process cotton, which means that majority of that unprocessed cotton, uh, as in, you know, what happens when you, the, the going from a, a bale of white cotton balls to actual material that happens in the majority of cases in China. So China is the biggest producer of cotton. It's also the biggest importer of cotton. So the vast global industry of cotton almost all runs through China, although a huge proportion of it does. And then it gets exported to these last stage kind of manufacturing countries are called cut, make, trim producers, the ones that just literally sew it together. So even understanding where your garments come from is, yeah, I mean, it's almost impossible. I mean, it's like the idea, it says, my garment says Cambodia on it. It's actually only known Cambodia for like a week. But those, the rest of the materials have been on this journey around the world. Often, you know, they've been imported to China in the first place from Uzbekistan, from Ivory Coast, from Australia, from the US. And on average, on average, if you buy that garment that says made in Cambodia, and by the way, I'm not saying don't because Cambodia is no worse than anywhere else. Um, but if you buy something that says made in Cambodia, then the materials alone have come some 14,000 kilometers before they even got to Cambodia. And then they've got another 18,000 to go before they get to you. So this hidden life of materials and all of the stuff that we use in our everyday lives, it's a real challenge uh, and it really is difficult. But again, it's all about making that buck stop by actually enforcing a lens on what's going on. Because the problem is it's just too obscure. And like there, was a, there was a test case that actually wasn't specifically around sustainability um, a few years ago. I think it was 2019, but it actually related to a more kind of political thing. So the, the Xinjiang region of China is kind of associated with a bit of um, this reputation of employing forced labor from the Uyghur community. And this kind of caught, there was a, there was a big kind of news splash around this around 2019. So a lot of companies were like, okay, we're not going to buy Xinjiang cotton anymore. But then loads of the companies that had said that subsequently had to roll back within a year because they were just like, we can't, we can't cut this out of our supply chain or like we cannot guarantee that it's not in our supply chain. That was the key bit because you, you can say I won't buy it directly, but somehow in this web of black boxes upon black boxes, like these things are going to get in somewhere and no one was willing to commit that kind of legal liability and say like, I can guarantee this isn't there. Um, yeah. And even like Stella McCartney, for example, came out and said, but like, even I, like, I can't, I don't know. We just don't know. So you should know it's a very much a thing if we don't want to know. Another really interesting mechanism for offsetting responsibility and accountability is even hidden in like the language of like carbon accounting. And so the fact that there's scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. And scope one is like what a company actually produces, what they feel that they have like control over. Um, scope two is a bit blurry for me. Maybe you can fill that in. And then scope three is essentially their supply chain. And they're like, Ooh, can't do anything about that, <laughs> you know? And it's really amazing because scope three, you know, in the life cycle of a product is obviously where the vast majority of emissions are created and it is also the scope in which every company around the world is going yeah no that one's not my that's not my responsibility that's can't do anything about that we will pressure our we will ask our supply chain 
you know, to, to do better. And it's astonishing when you see the difference in numbers between scope one and two emissions and scope three. Yeah, no, I mean, you're, you're totally right. I mean, uh, there's just a, there's a, there's a complete distinction in legislation between like scope one, for example, and scope three. So like scope one is just, yeah, as you say, it's production. Scope two is energy, right? So mm. that's the, the energy production that goes into your factory, for example. But yeah, scope three is the whole global world of production. And there's no meaningful actual legislation on that in the UK, certainly. Like companies sign up to, uh, you know, voluntary agreements. They say like, we're doing this kind of director's charter around this, but there's not actually anything tangible. So yeah, I mean, you're right. The language essentially does the sort of job of, it essentially employs a, a nationalistic logic around what we're actually you know, allowed to care about here. So like, we'll, we'll legislate this stuff that happens within our borders. But all of that rest of the vast majority of production that comes in, that's, that's on you guys out there. That's nice. They employ the nationalistic logic, which obviously lets these international corporations off the hook. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's, um, you know, it's the same logic that essentially our system of production has broadly been based on for the last few hundred years or so. I mean, that's something... I think that many people don't realize how many of these systems were essentially kind of set in train and kind of set up structurally all the way, you know, at the beginning of the industrial revolution. And again, I talk about garments a lot, partly because it's a really good kind of everyday contemporary example, like everybody wears clothes, so everyone can kind of relate to that. But also because it's an industry that because everyone's always worn clothes, that you can trace all the way back um, to the earliest parts of the industrial revolution. You can see what we actually did and how to, you know, how those systems were set up. So, I mean, for example, um, one of the things that I found really interesting actually researching this book was finding more out about this kind of history uh, and the deep history of it, which actually another person who would be great to talk to is Sven Becker, who's a kind of historian at Harvard who talks loads about this and the deep history of the garment industry. Um, but as it turns out, this kind of industry was one that was always essentially based on kind of wresting economic power away from other producers. So back when Britain first invented these new technologies like the spinning jenny and Arkwright's water frame, for example, these were new innovations. And we're often told, you know, like Britain led the industrial revolution, like we invented these things. It's like, yeah, we invented these things, but there were a whole lot of other steps in the way that you're not mentioning there, such as we can't grow cotton like we can't do it climatically. And even if we had the, even if we could do it climatically, there's nowhere near enough space in the whole British Isles to make enough cotton for, uh, for, for all of the demand that there was even back in the kind of 18th century. So the cotton had to come from somewhere else. We didn't have any land that could do it. That was the new dominion, the United States. And the problem, of course, was that there wasn't any labor there because they'd all died or been killed as a result of colonial intervention. So where does the labor come from? Oh, new dominions down south in Africa. And then this is the, this is the kind of less appreciated after the kind of sugar trade, less appreciated driving force of the industrial revolution and the role of slavery in it. This movement of millions of people from uh, sub-Saharan Africa to work in the cotton fields that were being planted in order to serve the industry set up by British industry. And of course, the the machines, the spinning jenny and the water frames and all of that and the factories, they remained in Britain. That's where the, the capital remained. And there was one further step, of course, which is that you had to break the, uh, the stranglehold of, uh, of India on the global cotton trade. Because at the time, the Indians were just absolutely had this sewn up, uh, to use a pun here, because it was, uh, it was so, they were so good at it, at producing this artisan cotton, super cheap, higher quality than anyone else could make. So the political invention political intervention there to break that kind of domination. And again, that was a, that was a political thing. It was about power and force. And that was the basis of the kind of global system of production of garments uh, that we see even to this day. Like if you think about how the global garment industry is set out today, <laughs> Cambodia looks like a producer, but actually it's not really producer. It's only a kind of, it's only the labor. The capital comes from other countries. It comes from wealthy Asian countries. It comes from places like the US, it comes from places like the UK. They're the ones who own the factories. Um, 
you know, and the and the land again, you know, that's, that's in China. It's in other places. It's in it's in Australia. It's in Uzbekistan. So this separation of land, labor, and capital, the devaluation of the labor within it, it's an age old system that has its roots hundreds of years in the past. And that logic, essentially, and this is, I mean, my real key point. <laughs> well, from with which I will, with which I will curtail this ramble, is that ultimately this naturalistic logic is fundamentally about one thing. That is that. Wealth moves to the center, wealth moves into the nation, waste moves out or it stays out. And that's the fundamental underlying nature of sustainability of industrial policy today and the problems that are underlying sustainability to this day. Wow. That is quite a line. Wealth moves into the nation, waste moves out. And just as you were talking there with this um, division of land, labor, and capital, and like these different geographic locations as well, one something that came to mind because recently interviewed Jamie Schneider on um, revolutions, the Green Democratic Revolution. It's a pretty safe way to guard against revolt in that sense. When you're dividing the parts of the economy that keep it functioning over. It means that, yes, somebody might have access to the labor. The labor, they have access to themselves. Maybe they could get access to the machines, but can they get access to the capital to make it all run? Or if they get access to the capital, do they have access to the machines? And that's what's so, it's like this divide and conquer tactic as well, threaded, to really extend this metaphor, well, they- <laughs> um, throughout our economic theory as well. Um, and so, that nationalistic logic, there's something quite, to me, and I am sorry, I, keep, I do keep bringing it back here, but it is because I'm quite obsessed with this question at the moment. But it's like all of these, like greenwashing, this presumption of nationalism or kind of, you know, the weakness of national governments in the face of X, it seems not deliberately engineered, um, but it seems kind of the natural runoff of a deliberately engineered system in which the idea, as you said, is to get wealth into the nation, into certain people's hands and get waste out of it. Like, how do you ensure that governments can't get too much in the way of the economic order? Well, you ensure that corporations are international and states remain national. Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, it certainly it benefits. It doesn't have to have been created as such, but it's certainly been created according to, you know, somebody, something is following interests, you know. Ultimately, developments in politics and economy, they often follow somebody's interest. And, you know, if you trace that back, there's a logic to it, even if it hasn't been designed necessarily in a kind of dark room with big padded chairs. Um, but yeah, this, um, this is really key, what you're talking about there, like the integration of the global economy uh, and understanding how all of the countries around the world are essentially tied into this to such a significant extent. Yeah, these countries who are either, you know, low level producer countries or even worse, kind of extractive economies, mm-hmm. they don't have an alternative. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very, very difficult to extract yourself from that economic global system and to kind of change your role within that system. You are ascribed a role according to your kind of resources as they are envisaged within the global system. Very, very difficult for a national government to say, like, actually, we want to just do something very differently. And there's some very few examples of that. I mean, one example, for example, is, uh, is Bhutan, who's kind of you know, taken itself to some extent out of this global system. It doesn't measure its kind of global development according to GDP. It uses gross national happiness. Um, it's eschewed tourism, like you have to pay $250 a day in order to enter Bhutan. So there's only a tiny trickle of tourists. And it's been very, very successful at maintaining its forest cover with 70%. Of uh, 71%, I think, of Bhutan's covered by forest, very low levels of deforestation. So Bhutan is a good example of that very, very rare thing that's almost impossible to do, sort of keeping yourself to the side of the global economy. But the vast majority of countries can't do that. And it's got a major role, not just in, you know, where you end up economically, but where you end up in terms of your vulnerability to the climate. And that's a key the key thing that we just keep seeing tragically day after day at the moment, like one of the things that I was, that happened almost exactly as the, as the book was coming out was there was this devastating kind of floods in, uh, in, in, uh, democratic Republic of Congo, gold miners. 
And of course, none of these people are mining gold for themselves or their local community. The vast majority of that is going onto the international market. The whole nature of that vulnerability of having so many people there, of having no flood defenses. Yeah, the hazard, the rains, that may have been a natural phenomenon accentuated by uh, rising temperatures. But you've got to think also about the vulnerability the hazard meets. And that vulnerability side, like the, the kind of context all of these hazards are actually meeting in our world, that's absolutely a function of the global system. It's not just like that. That's the, as a result of where Democratic Republic of Congo sits in that global system. We're seeing examples, you know, example after example. I mean, look at, you know, the devastating floods in Pakistan. Like these things don't happen in Europe, and it's not just about weather. It's because of the capacity to so manage that weather, the capacity to deal with those risks. I mean, look at Libya, similarly, another ex-colony. The devastating floods, five, 10,000 people killed. Again, this would not happen if it was in, uh, you know, if it was in Italy, the former colonizer. It just doesn't mm -hmm. work that way, the position in the global system. Absolutely. And an example, sorry to finish this again, that, that really brings that home is like Bangladesh, so vulnerable to all of this. And yet you compare Bangladesh to like the Netherlands, very similar topography, both really low lying. And yet the Netherlands and Bangladesh's vulnerability on a human level, at least, is just completely different to the climate because the, the Netherlands have the wealth from the global system to protect mm. itself to build its dikes and dams and its flood infrastructure. And so people don't live in fear of the environment. They don't die in huge numbers as a result. And that's a system that we have direct control over. And it's a direct product of our global economy. Absolutely. And the, the deliberate inequity that has been deliberately engineered, which means that we can sacrifice sort of climate stability and put billions of people at risk so that some of us can have the wealth in order to combat or mitigate those potential risks. Although, of course, like given the fragility of our food systems and how much of that we all import uh, in the West, you know, this whole thing of like, just build machines, suck it out the air, just, you know, build a wall, build a sea, we'll build this, build that. What, you're going to build food out of concrete? Like, how is that going to work for you as well? You know, we need healthy soil. We need healthy air. Uh, we need as well like a populace that has that kind of like intergenerational knowledge that like all of these things have been stamped out because you didn't want your own population to know how to feed themselves because that's how you also get them trapped into the economy originally. Um, that wealth is not going to be a thing that can protect, I think, like after 2050, you know, it, it, to an extent, but you cannot feed people one pound coins. Um, <laughs> simply. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> and you know what? It just popped into my head. You know those like chocolate coins. <laughs> <laughs> Laurie, I'm I'm aware of our time. This has been really really fascinating. I'm going to put a link to your book, of course, in the show notes. My final question for you is: Who would you like to platform? Um. Well, there's so many people, but I think something that would kind of link quite well into the discussions we've had today um, would be. Um, the work of Cassia Proprosky, who does some fantastic work on adaptation and vulnerability in Bangladesh. She's got a great book called Threatening Dystopias. And she works a lot on the kind of other side of this whole equation, which is, you know, the ways in which adaptation, which is kind of, you know, development policy and sustainability policy around helping people in the global South to cope with these impacts, how that is also itself political, or as she calls it, anti-political, how it serves these same interests that we've been talking about today. So, so yeah, not, not necessarily uh, the sunniest of topics, but I think it's important. <laughs> uh, these are all very important topics. And the more that we all discuss them, the more that we ho have hope of some sunshine further down the line. Well, so, exactly, exactly. That's the thing. You've got to go into the tunnel topic. before you can get the, the light <laughs> at the end. <laughs> 40 days and 40 nights, everybody. <laughs> Laurie, this has been great. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you very much. Enjoyed it. If you want to learn more, I've put links to everything in the description box below. Remember to subscribe to the channel if you're new here and share the episode if you enjoyed it. To support the show, subscribe at planetcritical.com where you can read the weekly newsletter inspired by each interview. You can also become a Planet Critical patron. All links are in the description box below. As always, my deepest thanks to that community. Planet Critical wouldn't exist without your support. Thank you everyone for listening and for coming on this journey together.